Amen. Thank you, sinners, for leading our hearts in song this morning. It's great to be here. It's great to come before our God, to give Him our time, our hearts, our minds, and to consider who He is before us. You know, I was reading the other day, I went back and the account of Moses in the desert. And there was this time when the Bible says that God came down in Mount Sinai. And he, he literally engulfed the mountain in great fire. And he said smoke just was like all over the place. And the people stood there. And as Moses went up, he said, go down and tell the people, don't come up here. Because this up here is not for them. And the reality was that, you know, there was such a, an amazing fear of who God was. Because they saw the fire, they saw the smoke. You know, we don't get to see that like these guys saw back then. But I do hope that we connect with God enough to know that you know, He is mighty. He is powerful. And that when we come before His presence, we do need to have a sense of reverence of awe and of fear before Him. Because the last thing we want to do is to take our God for granted. Amen? Amen. So I pray that as you sang songs this morning, that your heart has continued to be stirred by the encouragement that we received so far through communion. Thank you very much, my beautiful wife. Hearing about what it means to be great disciples and having continuous hearts of giving as we set an example. But I pray this morning as we get into God's word that our hearts will be stirred even more. That we will consider what the Spirit is saying to us at this time. But before we get into our text, I do want to share um, just a little note from our sister Donna. As you guys know, our brother Patrick is, is still warded at uh, the Medical Associates Hospital. And um, we are continually praying for him. And God continues to, to work and continues to be with him. Uh, but Donna, send this to church, to our church family, please. Um, she said she wanted me to read Philippians 1.7. And I'll find that. Let's find that. And it says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. So, she said, thank you for giving your... Sorry, let me back it up here. We would like to express our heartfelt and sincere gratitude and love for, pray for your prayers, concerns, and love while Patrick has been ill. Thank you for giving your blood and being willing to give blood. For the food you provided and the time spent in the hospital with us, the total support and help, you, our church, our friends, our hearts are truly appreciated. Your love has made an impact on the Caesar's family. Just to give you an update, Patrick is not yet discharged because he was running a temperature and the doctors were unsure of why. We are hopeful he will be set, sent home today and will be completely healed. We want to apologize for having to restrict visitors because of the nature of the illness and the need for maximum rest as part of recuperation. But as soon as he can, visitors will be let known, so to speak. So we love you all very much and look forward to seeing everyone prayerfully soon, Patrick and Donna. You know, we need to give God praise and thanks for the prayers that he's answered. And I pray that we continue to pray for our brother, Patrick, as he continues to recover. Amen? So, you know, this morning we continue, our brother Tyrone did a phenomenal job of kind of setting us up in our second pillar for of our theme for the year, which we're in what? Motion, yeah, right? We're in motion, we're not stagnant, we're moving, right? And um, 
I love the way in which it was introduced because it's, it's really setting us up for victory, I believe. Because now we're being called to think about us personally, individually, not necessarily collectively, although we do have to do that as well. But then there's a, there's a real thrust behind us thinking about where am I right now? And am I taking real responsibility for my walk with God? For my personal growth? And I pray that you have been challenged. If you haven't been, then I hope you get challenged by that. Because I do believe that we all can continue to grow. Maybe you are growing, and praise God for that. But God wants to take you to newer heights in Him. Amen? So I pray that we all will continue to, to work on the areas that we know we need to work on. Allow our strengths to, to, to bloom, to blossom. Allow the church to see us thrive in the areas of our strengths. But when the areas of our weaknesses come up, let's work at them. Let's, let's, let's pray. Let's ask God to help us to grow so we can become more and more like His Son. Amen? You know, the Bible says, or should I say, when you, the more you read about Jesus, it's very interesting. You know, we can easily look at Jesus and think, well, he was the Son of God. He's all-knowing, all-seeing. He's God in the flesh. All-powerful and all of that stuff, Right? And yes, he was all of those things and is all of those things and more. You know, this could be a mistake or a big mistake for us as followers of Jesus because we can miss the point of why did he do what he did in the first place. And it's very important that we understand Jesus' intent for why he did what he did. Healing the sick, even on the Sabbath. Driving out those in the temple who were changing money, etc., calling out the Pharisees, calling out the Pharisees for who they were, choosing the 12 disciples, even Judas, and many other things that he did. You know, everything Jesus did had a purpose behind it, which ultimately came down to saving us, to saving souls. But he also left us an amazing example of the foundation he built, even as a child. You know, this morning we're going to be talking about the amazing growth of Jesus. And I pray that we can glean from Jesus' growth through the scriptures and allow for ourselves to dream and aspire to grow spiritually as we look at our, our Lord grow himself. But before we get into the scriptures this morning, let's pray. I'm going to spend a little time praying for four specific brothers and sisters or one sister in there, we know we have at least four mature people in our congregation who are not well at this time. Patrick, Bob, Vincent, and Mary Finley. Let's pray at this time. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come before your throne. God, help us not take that for granted. Help us to never think that everything is okay, and it's okay for us to just kind of waltz in and out and become so routine in our worship before you that we even forget that our hearts need to run them before you as well. I pray that, God, we will give our all to you in everything we do, in singing, in fellowship, in conversations, as we read your word. Help us to, to, to allow our minds to worship you as well, so that, God, we can think about what is it that your word is saying to us individually. We love you, God, and we thank you for your amazing uh, healing hand in our lives. And we thank you so much for taking care of our brother Patrick so far. We pray that you continue to be with him. Continue to, to watch over him. Uh, continue to, to, to see him through this period of his life. And I pray that God, ultimately God, you will get the glory and the honor. Uh, may your name resoundingly ring out in his family, God, and all those who are around him at this time. Continue to strengthen Donna. Uh, may, she, may her arms be strong, God, so that she can take care of Patrick. But help us, God, extensively, God, to be able to be there for them and to continue to be a source of inspiration, help, and support. God, we also pray for our brother Bob, that you continue to be with him as well. Thank you for his impact on many lives, God. Now, we heard about the church in Boston, how much they loved him, and I know that we all love him dearly as well. Continue to watch over him, be with Cedrin. We know that she has a big task on her hand taking care of him. 
But God, you continue to, to give us strength. And I pray that we too, God, will continue to be a great support to them as well. Continue to nurse Bob back to great health as well too. Be it our brother Vincent. God, I pray that even though he's unable to be with the fellowship, God, continue to be with him, Father. Strengthen his faith and his resolve in you. And may his heart continue to, to, to cry out to you daily. Uh, be it Violet, strengthen her as well, God, as his wife. Help her to continue to, to trust in you. And I pray that, God, you will continue to be with them. And last but not least, God, we pray for Sister Mary Finley. God, we know that she has been an amazing example before the saints. Serving tirelessly, God, giving her all. And God, um, we know that, Father, you, you, you love her. God, you will take care of her. We ask that, God, you continue to, to watch over her in, in a great way. But God, I pray that, Father, we will not forget to go visit. We will not forget to call. We will not forget to, to, to really f fight to figure out how we can be encouraging. I pray that the saints will rally. And all those who are sick, those who I may not be able to call their names this morning, God, you know them. Be with them at this time. Father, we love you, God. We thank you again for your mercy, your grace, God, uh, which, Father, we pray that we respond with hearts of gratitude, thinking about what you've done for us. May your word be preached this morning. Uh, may I remove myself, and God, may you be up front and center. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our passage this morning is read from Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 41. And it is said that this passage is the only one of its kind, describing a period of Jesus' life that only this passage actually reads out when he was a boy. And this morning I have three points. My first point will be the most lengthy one. The last two will be a little shorter, so we bring it home within time, preferably. But point number one is a spiritual foundation. You know, when we think about growth, you got to think about there is a beginning to it, right? The Bible says in verse 41 of chapter 2 in Luke, Every year, Jesus, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. And we stop right there. So, basically, Jewish males were obligated to keep three festivals. One, the festival of unleavened bread, which was the Passover. Then the festival of weeks, which was Pentecost and the Festival of Booths, which is the Tabernacles. Uh, you can see that in Deuteronomy 16, Exodus 23, and 34. Now this is a significant journey from Nazareth, as we recall here, about 60 miles or 100 kilometers, requiring several days' travel each way in addition to a week in Jerusalem. So such a trip involves a significant commitment of time and money, like a two-week vacation, so to speak. Think about those of us who are planning to go to Orlando for the summit. Yeah? All right. Think about the planning you had to put together to find that money, to pay for that ticket, figure out where you're going to stay, organize food, and so on. And maybe even for those of us who had to leave children behind, figure out how they're going to be taken care of. It's a lot of planning going on. Well, I believe Mary and Joseph made some planning as well to be at this festival every year, as recorded in scriptures. Now, this is an expensive pilgrimage for Joseph and Mary, an act of true devotion. You know, Luke records Jesus' age as we go on, as for a reason, I believe. At age 12, Jesus is not yet obligated to keep the festivals, but will become obligated at, the th at, th at his 13th birthday. So even before the obligation for Jesus came about, they began to, I, I, I would say, get him involved in spiritual things. They were like, okay, you know, we're your 13, 13, sorry. We're going to take you to these festivals so you can get acquainted with what we do as a family. You know, we see not only a great foundation being set by Jesus' parents, 
or it's said by Jesus, but are championed by his parents also. You know, their example of commitment and devotion was stellar. Taking baby Jesus to these festivals yearly as a child was no easy task. But they understood the importance of the kind of foundation needed to be built. You know, as parents today, and this is not a parenting devotional, but I do believe we have, we have to hear and get context as parents because we have a huge responsibility to lay a spiritual foundation for our children, no matter what age they are. As parents today, we are very concerned about the well-being of our children. Can I get an amen? From inside the womb, we begin to prepare by reading books to the belly, singing them songs, thinking you're going to be a superstar. Just don't pay attention to my voice. You have to listen to Michael Jackson or Percy Sledge and all these guys who have great voices, you know? Or maybe it's Aretha Franklin or, or whoever else, right? So our hope is, oh yeah, Whitney, yeah, I, I can tell who are the ones who are doing that, right? Come on. No, we talk to them daily. And I know we have a few young parents in the house who can remember those days. We begin to plan for their education way before they could even read. That's a good thing, by the way. Once they come out of the womb, the very next visit is to the primary school of choice to register them. You all know that, right? People register their children the minute they get a name. That's real. I remember in all the days when we went to register our, our daughter at the time, she couldn't get into certain school because the line was so long and the list was so long. Everybody was registering in this school from way, way in advance. We know Cummins are is what, five, six? And they're like, no, but it's my child registered since she was six weeks old. Now we spend thousands of dollars on extracurricular activities. Can we go there? Let's go there, right? I had to go there because I can relate. We experience or we inconvenience our lives for their development. That's so? Or maybe it's really for our glory. Let's be real, right? I know sometimes when I see my children in the papers, I kind of feel, all right, all right boy, that's my son, that's my daughter. And the reality is that we could tend to want to take the limelight as well, too. But what about the other side of the coin? What about the spiritual foundation? Investing in personal Bibles for them over a new series that they like. My daughter loves to read. Maybe your child does too. But do they have a proper Bible at their home? Or are you just relying on the internet to allow for them to use your version? I don't know. You know somehow I, I know for us, we do have our your version, but we got our own Bibles as well too. I think our children need it as well. As, as well. As well. Okay. You know, we spend thousands, sorry, my bad. But do you have a spiritual plan for your child? How deliberate are you? Is teen camp an issue financially every year? Or are you planning in advance? You know, every year we talk about teen camp. Every year. It's over and over. You know it's coming. But sometimes we get caught. What should I say most times? I, be, I believe that it's a, it's a big telltale. You know, our daughter, she is now transitioning into the teen ministry. It's kind of scary right now, to be quite honest. We took her to the teen orientation on Friday. But as I was going, as we were driving the car, I said to myself, all right, we got to set this thing up right. Because right away, I began to realize that Fridays are no longer ours. Friday evening from 5.30 to, to 7. That's it. For the next however years, she'll be in the teen ministry. That time is now allocated to teens devotional. So we had a good talk in the car. 
And I said, honey, all right, guess what? We can't plan nothing on a Friday anymore. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, we got teen devotional. No, I'm, I'm not sure if she's going right away right now, but I'm, I'm setting her up because I don't want to come down here. But I have this, I have cricket, I have, because she's in all kinds of stuff. But I think I know now in advance, we got a plan because this is your spiritual foundation we're talking about. This is very important. We already decided that, guess what? There's no chess practice on a Friday anymore. Or it has to either be before or after. Don't know how that's going to work, but teen devotional trumps all of that. You know, so we had to talk. You know, Joseph and Mary laid a proper foundation that inspired how spiritual little Jesus was. And I, I go through the pains to express how, you know, Jesus was flesh. And he did grow, and we'll talk about that as we go down. But I do think it's kind of hard sometimes to conceptualize that, right? But Jesus, what he, he's God. He didn't need to grow. He knew everything. But no, the Bible says that he grew. You know, I believe that this example is here to teach us how to build. If you're a teenager, spiritual growth is not beyond you. Early to 20s, early 20s to 30s, 40s, even in your 60s and beyond, you know, we can still grow. We can still lay a foundation so we can grow in our relationship with God. You know, Moses learned how to delegate at an old age. Aaron made mistakes but turned things around. Paul repented and became an amazing tool for God's glory. And the stories go on and on. So no matter how old you get, there is always time to rebuild, reshape our lives to reflect the spiritual growth that God desires for us. Even if you feel down and out spiritually, can anybody relate? Maybe you're tired. You're stuck. Been there, done that, Nino. You can rebuild as well. You can rebuild a proper foundation. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to 9, he says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. You know, the Hebrew writer here warns us to take heed of the Israelites who refused to reshape their thinking and essentially kept their old foundation and perished because of it. Are we set in our ways this morning? Are we so dogmatic about how we see things that we can't learn anymore? That nobody can teach me anymore. I read them scriptures not long ago. I know this verse inside out. Well, has it allowed for you to grow or are you still stuck? And no matter where you are, the only way to grow like Jesus grew is to have a right foundation. For us, there's no doubt who that foundation is. It is Jesus himself. The true cornerstone, the Bible calls him. He is the spiritual foundation. Point number two, a spiritual focus. A spiritual focus. In verse 43, we read down to 50. It says, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were, they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard of him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, 
Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have anxiously been searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. A spiritual focus. You know, we are familiar with the famous sayings of Jesus. Go tell that fox. You remember that? That's in Luke, right? That verse goes on, I think it's in Luke 13. It says, at that time soon, or some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. You know, this is just one of the verses that highlights the amazing focus Jesus had when it came to what his father sent him to do. You know, in Luke, we see the first glimpse of his focus-mindedness of Jesus. But in verse 49 of our text this morning, he says what? Mary and they left, didn't realize where Jesus was, thought he was among the family with him and everything, because normally when they leave that pilgrimage or that Passover, it would be a huge among the people leaving at once. And they're all coming from different neighboring um, places. So as, as they go, the first thrust of people are going to be a huge, thick amount of persons going out. But as they reach the first, second town and villages, it starts to dwindle. And you have less people. So at some point in time, after one day, they're like, Where, where's Jesus? And they began to look for him and realized he was not with them. So for three days, they looked for Jesus. They went back to Jerusalem and they found him there. And look at what he says. He says, why were you searching for me? He asked. Did you know, not know, didn't you know, sorry, I had to be in my father's house? You know, it's interesting because this wasn't just a focus for, on himself. He was focused on his father's will. He was focused on what is God's intention for me? Why am I here? While I'm here on earth? You know, this same focus would be challenged in the garden as he came face to face with the cross itself. But he would quickly refocus himself and march his way down the Via Della Rosa, knowing fully what was in store for him. So the question I asked this morning, or questions, what focus does one have to have to place his life in the hands of God? What focus does one have to have to trust God with all his or her finances, his job situation? What focus does one need to have to be involved in the mission daily? What focus does one have to have to keep oneself pure and unpolluted by this world? What focus do you need to have to make it to the end of the race? I believe it's a spiritual focus. How do we keep such a focus? Well, I think Jesus laid a very, very good example for us. The Bible says that Jesus developed himself or developed a focus spiritually by saturating himself with God's word. In verse 46, it says, After three days they found him in the temple doing what? Sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Is that you this morning? Who are you sitting at? Who is speaking to you? Whose feet are you at right now? Is it yourself? Is it a co-worker who you know very well can't really help you spiritually? Maybe it's an old friend who you've drawn, drawn very close to over the years. And you tell yourself, well, I can confide in you. But there's no spiritual foundation being built or no direction being laid. You know, Jesus knew that he had to listen to those who knew about his father. Those who knew about the Torah, 
who understood what did God speak to the Israelites about? And he listened to them. And he also asked questions. You know, he sat at the feet of the teachers and listened as they taught the, the scriptures. He asked questions and discussed the scriptures with them. He showed great enthusiasm for God's word. He was also humble and teachable. How are we doing in this area? You know, if we want to grow spiritually, I mean, we've got a lot of help from Tyrone so far. But I do believe that we got to buckle down and ask ourselves, man, how disciplined I am when it comes to my scripture studies. When it comes to opening the Bible daily and asking God, what does your word say to me? Taking time to read or, or allow God's word to penetrate our hearts and teach us about certain things when it comes to our focus on him. Are you focused, are you focused on what is spiritual or do you have an earthly focus? I do believe that it's very tempting to focus on the earth and what is down here. We have many distractions. We have many stresses, many issues, many dramas. We are striving or clanging or trying to get our attention on a daily basis. But we have to ask ourselves, man, where does God want me to focus? And how important is it for me to do so? Now, when we come to church on a Sunday or a Wednesday, are we easily distracted? Or are we locked in to what the Spirit is saying to us individually? You know, are, you, are we done with learning? Or are we teachable? And it's amazing how, you know, Jesus, being the Son of God, came and set an amazing example of what it meant to have a, a student's heart. And to be somebody who would learn from others. You know, if the Son of God could humble himself and sit at the feet of men to learn, what, ex what excuse do we have for not sitting at the feet of each other? None whatsoever. We would have no excuse. So let's take example from Jesus and have a spiritual focus which allows us to listen and ask questions to see how we can grow. You know, I remember being a young Christian, and there are things that I didn't know, but the only way I could grow is to ask questions, is to talk to people, is to get advice, go around and sit at people's feet. So I sat at people's feet. I sat at, at family group leaders. I spoke to the, the minister. I spoke to those who I knew were spiritually mature in their faith and asked questions. And I believe we do that. But I don't know if we do it enough. Maybe we choose what we want to seek advice in. I'll seek advice about my finances. But when it comes to my romantic life, mm -mm. don't ask me about that. I don't need no input on that. I go handle myself with that. Is that your heart this morning? I know the singles are we are constantly talking about this topic about dating. But are you open? Are you really open to the input that you're receiving? I hope we are. And I believe that God's Spirit desires to give us what we need. And a lot of times, we get in trouble when we focus on what we want. There's no magic wand to weave to give us the things that we want. There are a lot of things I want, honestly. But God ain't giving it to me because I, I believe he knows that if you give it to me, it ain't going to help me spiritually. It's not best for me. And I have to learn to trust him with that. I have to learn to trust that, guess what? He knows what's best for me. But when we lose trust, we begin to grumble and complain. And we don't see God's hand in our lives. That's not, it's a miserable place to be. Because God is trying to teach us some things and guess what? He ain't going to stop doing what he's doing until you learn it. You think he will be like, alright, alright, okay, we'll get back to that. No. He's like, no, I'm going to refine you. You're going to remain right there. And when you get it, guess what? It'll be okay. You'll be better for it on the other side. And if you are not a disciple or a Christian this morning, 
Then be like Jesus and ask questions so you can learn more about God and his expectations for your life. Make time to sit down and study the Bible. It will change your life. It did for me 21 years ago. When I thought I had it okay, but I realized that my life was a mess. I saw the sin, the deceit, the immorality, the impurity, the lust, the greed, lying, everything possible. But it's only when I allow God's word to impact my life. And I listened. I sat at men's feet. I listened to what they had to say. And I allowed them to impact my heart through God's word. This is the only way I'm able to stand before you today. Because God did what he had to do. But I had to learn. I had to grow. I had to allow myself to learn. You know, are you lukewarm this morning? You know what lukewarm is? You're neither hot nor cold. Are you? That's a good question to ask. We talked about self-evaluation. Looking at self and asking ourselves, man, where am I? Am I really right with God right now? Is God pleased with me? Am I grieving the Holy Spirit? Or is he joyful? In one of the areas I, I struggled in recently was sharing my faith. I found it really hard at, at different points to talk about Jesus. I remember going on campus one day and I, it took me all but maybe 20 minutes before I could open my mouth. I'm just being real. I lost my spiritual food. I lost my zeal in that area. And I remember this Friday, going, we went to campus and we said to ourselves, all right, the goal is we go in campus for one hour. The first half hour, we're going to go share our faith. The second half an hour, we're going to have a Bible discussion. And I challenged myself. I said, all right, we got to get back on the horse. I have to get back in the race. I have to get back focused on what God has called me to do. So I went out. I took Joshua with me. And we went and we just talked to everybody that moved. And God blessed. We met two guys who are open to studying the Bible. And I have two Bible studies set up next week, Wednesday. Praise God for that. But the reality is that it took me making a real decision. That guess what? I'm going to get off of my behind and I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to decide, guess what? I need to work on this area. I can't be lukewarm for God. I have to be either hot, sadly, or cold. Because God was spitting me out of his mouth. How are you going? Are you focused? Let's get focused again, brothers and sisters. Amen? Last point, a spiritual flourish. It's amazing what we see happen with Jesus. In verse 51, it says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Three things Jesus grew in. Wisdom. In understanding and knowledge of the scriptures. He grew in these areas. Are you growing in your wisdom? Are you making better choices? Better decisions? Maybe you made real foolish ones last year. Are you making better ones this year? Is there a change? Are we growing? That's the expectation that God has for us. That's how Jesus grew. He grew in his stature. The Greek word is helikaya, helikaya, which means years, height, and also maturity. Right? So Jesus grew even in his physical self. He took care of himself, but he allowed for his own physical body to be in such a way that he could mature and be 
of great help to those around me, let it be his mom, his brothers and sisters, then I do believe that this speaks of the clarity that we have to think about who Jesus was. He did grow. He was human. So it meant that in his growing, his capacity for knowledge would increase also. So it meant that even as he grew mature, and he matured physically, he matured spiritually as well. Are you growing spiritually with age? Or are you still making the same mistakes? Brothers, how is our purity? Can I get an amen from the brothers? Can I get an amen from the brothers? Are we still men of God? Amen, Neil. It's good to have you on board, my brother. I hope we are. You know, the world is constantly telling you that you're weak. That pornography, masturbation, lust, this is just what men do. The statistics speak about it. And we naturally, sometimes as men, we tell ourselves, well, that's who he is. We need to grow. We need to mature. Church is not for women. And we know that. It is for all of us. As a matter of fact, men led the way. And we need to lead the way, brothers. Let our sisters feel as though they are being led by strong spiritual men who are growing in their love for Jesus, who are growing in their love for righteousness, in their love for holiness. And as the world looks at us, they must see us and think, what's going on with you? Something is wrong because you're not like everyone else. It's because you're growing spiritually. You're growing in stature and maturity. Not only physically, but also spiritually. You know, one of the hard things about growing is when you hit a little bump in the road. And I used to go to the gym, and I, I felt as I was making some good progress. Yeah, and Duet says he thought so too. I heard you, bro. And I would, I would have you. My wife said I was making progress, and she doesn't lie when it comes to those things. So I was very, very happy about my progress until about a month ago, I got tendonitis in my right wrist. And I was told by my wife at the time that, honey, I think you're going a little too heavy in the gym. So I didn't take her on at that time. Of course, it turns out that she was right again. And doctors Peter and Sandy Sweet, we all way from Jamaica came. And Sandy was like, bro, no more lifting of weights. Let's just say I was struggling big time. So for the last three weeks, going on four weeks, I couldn't go to the gym. I had to just kind of pause. And, but now I have to think about not even doing it at all. And that kind of threw me for, I don't know, a little turmoil. Because I thought to myself, what do you mean I can't go and lift weights? And, you know, that was just hard. But then she told me, no, up your cardio, there are different things you can do exercise-wise, and it just means that you're not going to be pumping iron, if so to speak. And the reality is that I had to change my mind about how things were. I had to think about, okay, I have to think about a different way to approach this thing. I believe that spiritually, we got to think about that. You may be stuck, but you got to figure it out. Don't just sit down there and wallow in self-pity. Figure it out. Do something. Go on a prayer walk. Go up Mount St. Benedict and bawl out to God. Help me. Talk to people. Confess your sin. Just get it out there. Do what you have to do. It may not be the same that you did before. 
But you got to do something different because you're in a different time and situation. But if you just sit there and decide, I just come to church, go back home, come to church, go back home, nothing will change. Nothing will change. As a matter of fact, we get we regress more than anything else. Before you know it, boy, I ain't on that way. I ain't feel like coming to church now. I feel like let's stay, stay home and I'll watch the message on, on, on online. That's what happens. Because you did nothing about it. So guess what? Homeboy put on a few pogs in the last three weeks for sure. Because I did nothing. I wallowed in my self-pity. Oh gosh, I can't go in the gym. I went and I ran once. I got up a couple of days and I did some sit-ups and nothing. nothing of any substance. But I realized, you know what? I can't just decide, well, because I can't do what I want to do, not because things aren't the same way that it used to be, I just kind of give up. No. I believe Jesus came through many storms. He dealt with many hiccups in his journey, in his ministry. He dealt with several knuckleheads. At one point, he was like, how long will I put up with you? Remember he told his disciples that? But he stuck in there with them. He would pray to God. He would cry out to him. That's how he stayed in the fight. That's how he matured. The Bible says that he, he learned obedience by what he suffered. Are you willing to suffer so that you can grow? The last thing he, he, sorry, he grew in was in favor with God and man. He not only found favor in the, high, in the eyes of his father, but in men as well. And Jesus was a, he was a great example. He lived a, a life of great impact to those who were around him. And they, they looked at him. They saw him. I'm sure his work as a carpenter was probably flawless. Kind of like Marcel, right? You want a guy like Marcel to build your kitchen and do stuff for you, and, you know? Because he just does an amazing job, you know? But that's the reality. Jesus grew in stature, in wisdom, and in favor with God and man. What an amazing growth we see in Jesus. That from a boy, he grew to become a man that embodied those qualities. I'll end off with one last scripture. The Bible says in Colossians 2, Paul, I believe, describes Jesus in one of the most amazing ways. That I, I, it's the first time I really delve into this passage. In verse 2 of chapter 2 in Colossians, it says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Here it is in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is found in Jesus. That's how amazingly Jesus grew. That he embodied all wisdom and knowledge. You know, Jesus flourished spiritually to the point where all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge were hidden in him according to Paul. What amazing growth. And I pray that we are all amazed and inspired by the growth of Jesus this morning. But I also pray that we take heed of the importance for us all to grow as well. Let it be said that you, let it be said of you that you flourished spiritually. No matter where you feel you're at right now. Maybe you just think, I'm bombing it. I am nowhere close. I, I just barely make it to church this morning. That's okay. You too can flourish spiritually. You too can grow in your faith. 
and in your love. You can grow in wisdom, in stature, in favor of God and man, just like Jesus did. You know, a spiritual foundation, a spiritual focus, leads to a spiritual flourish, which ultimately speaks of the amazing growth of our Lord Jesus. I pray that we would all allow the life of Jesus to inspire our hearts and our lives as we strive to, to become more and more like him because we know that it's only in him that we can grow spiritually. Amen? Amen. God bless you.